But thank you all for coming. You know, um, I'm just going to say for the record, since these videos go on YouTube for others to review later, um, this is another Door County Community Town Hall meeting on child care. And I'm Christina Studebaker, Community Impact Coordinator with United Way. And um, I'll sort of be facilitating tonight's meeting. Uh, we've been holding these meetings since mid-October, every other week since mid-October. So we've been um, at this for three and a half months now. And um, I know that I have learned a lot. And I imagine that all of you, your, your regulars, you keep coming back. I hope you find it interesting. And I hope you're also um, learning some things. I love the group discussion and comments. It um, triggers my thoughts about things and the work that we're trying to do. So it's really helpful. Um, so you should feel free to, you know, reach out at any time with thoughts. I know Margie sends me um, information on different things to explore. Jane sent me an email um, this afternoon with an article about home-based providers and um, things going on in Delaware. So I appreciate all of that information because it's um, a challenging topic. It's a challenging issue to get some movement on, but I feel like we have to stay on top of it because it's one of those things that if you just, um, you know, it feels like you're not making progress, but if you stop, you're really going to slide backwards and you can quickly go into crisis mode. So I really appreciate that. Um, so so far over the last three and a half months, what we've been focused on um, in conjunction with the statewide study on um, child care and the birth to five strategic plan that came out from DSF is that the, the issues are access, affordability, um, quality, and then recruitment and retention of workforce. And so all of the, we, we've just been taking a deeper dive on each one of these topics from a different perspective, every town hall meeting. And um, our primary goals are to provide opportunities for discussion and sharing of ideas on ways to um, not just sustain, but improve our local child care system. And when I say child care system, I mean the licensed group centers, the licensed home-based providers and the unlicensed home-based providers because that is how our children are cared for and are learning. So you have to have all of that on the radar screen. And we've been um, trying to get a, a better, broader understanding of how all of these things impact what their current status is and how we can improve that across the county. Um, so, we, we didn't necessarily go in an, a particular order in terms of the meetings because we were dependent upon when speakers were available. But some of the topics that um, we covered, we've looked at um, child brain development, and we know that kids are born learning, and the type of learning that happens first is the social and emotional learning and that the individuals who are the primary critical source of this learning are the adult child care providers that interact with the children. So that includes parents and other family members, and then child care providers, if a family utilizes a child care provider who's not a family member. So the, the, the national statistics I found on child care indicate that about 60% of parents with a child younger than five years old regularly rely on someone other than themselves to provide care for the child. And in May of last year, when the pandemic was hitting and the status of the Barker Center was a little questionable and we were trying to get a read on what um, community needs were, we conducted an online survey. And um, so we didn't, we, we had um, almost 200 respondents. I think people dropped out at different portions of the survey. So we're close to 200 or a little over 200, depending upon which question in the survey you're looking at. But out of those respondents, 81% um, reported that prior to the safer at home mandate, 
They regularly relied on someone other than themselves or their partner to care for their child at least part of the day. And then that survey also gathered information on the types of child care providers families are using. And so I'm going to share my screen and give you um, a summary of that chart. So, whoops, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So here you see that 81%, I don't know, can you see my cursor where I'm circling the pie? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, that 81% said that they relied on someone other than themselves, their partner. And then if you rely on someone, who is that? And people were asked to check all that apply. So if you tally up these percentages, you will get more than 100%. Um, I think about 60% of the respondents indicated that they relied on one source. Um, about 30 or so relied on two different sources for childcare. And then some people relied on as many as four sources for childcare. And so you see here that 8% um, reported using a licensed home-based provider and 7.6% reported using an unlicensed home-based childcare provider who's not a neighbor. But these up here, just below the licensed child care facility, these are still, even though they're not getting paid, for all intents and purposes, I consider these people home-based providers. They're people who are interacting with your kids, taking care of your kids, mm -hmm. and influencing their learning. And so, um, you know, we've provided all these categories so that people could choose the categories they felt most comfortable with and that were most mm -hmm. descriptive. Um, if we just put home-based providers, we'd have significant but somewhat low percentages. When we look at these other things, we see who people are relying on and who we want to hear from to understand what this home-based care looks like. And regardless, um, we know that in-home providers are a big part of the local child care system. And we've mentioned this in... Um, multiple previous town hall meetings. And if we want to improve our child care system, we need to understand the experiences of the in-home providers. And I would argue that the best case scenario, we would have lots of information from these individuals. We would understand, we would learn about the number and the ages of the kids they care for, the days and hours during which they provide care, the resources they have at their disposal, their training or background and additional resources that could be helpful to them. But we're currently not at that stage of understanding. And frankly, we've had challenges in terms of connecting with home-based providers through different um, pathways. We've tried to connect with them and we just haven't been successful. Um, mm -hmm. And it appears that the county has a history of that also, connecting with home-based providers to try and understand and help them with licensure and certification mm -hmm. if they want to. Yes. Um, they just don't get anybody, hardly anybody coming to mm -hmm. the meetings. So I still wanted though to mm -hmm. hit that topic and address that issue in the town hall meetings so that we've made an attempt, we've done something to get a, a better understanding. Mm -hmm. So once again, I went to my trusty friend, YouTube, and <laughs> I spent some time searching for information on home-based childcare. And there's a lot of different videos, you know, it's one of those things that you don't know it's out there until you search for it and you're like, oh my God, there's so much information. <laughs> so there's stuff out there from people across the country, um, they have day in the life videos, they have recommendations about um, activities you can do with kids, they have recommendations about what policies you need to have with clients, um, how to apply for license, licensing. Um, and it's clear that some of the videos are posted by people who are licensed and others it's questionable. And so I, I took a while to go through things and say, is there something here that could be useful to us? 
And ultimately, I selected a group of videos from um, a home-based provider in Minnesota. Her name is Sarah, and she describes herself as, quote, an English teacher turned nanny turned daycare provider. Mm -hmm. And she has a husband who's a chef and three young daughters. She grew up on a hobby farm with chickens, ducks, goats, cows, dogs, cats, rabbits, and a burrow. And she decided to own um, her own home-based childcare business after the birth of her first daughter. She had been working as a nanny. She had her daughter. The nanny situation was not working out. So she decided to open her own business. And then she also started posting videos online and a website called worklifeblue.com in case anyone's interested in learning more about her after the videos. And she helps moms and other daycare providers or child care providers with organization, um, indoor outdoor projects, personal development, and just a host of other things. And so her video struck me because aspects of her life seem consistent with some of the things that we encounter in Door County. Her husband's a chef. He has an unpredictable schedule. She grew up on a farm. She's in this cold climate. Um, and so rather than think people in New York or people in California, where I was also finding videos, there were things about this woman's personal life that I thought if we were, had been able to connect with a local home-based provider, they might say some things like what this woman has said. Hmm. So she has a host of videos, but three videos caught my attention. One of them, she talks about the benefits of being a home-based provider. In another one, she talks about the drawbacks of being a home-based provider. Mm -hmm. And then in the third one, she ultimately talks about why she's quitting her childcare business. Mm -hmm. And so I thought all of these things would be helpful to us mm -hmm. and help us have so be the, the foundation for some good discussion that we could then take this on our own. So, um, I'm going to show excerpts from the drawbacks video and the why she's quitting video, but it's still helpful to start with just, I summarize the 10 things that she says are benefits of being a home-based provider because they're pretty straightforward. And I think we can all understand what they are pretty clearly. So, oops, I'm already up, so I don't need to do that. So, oh, crud. I've stopped sharing. Let me share again. Here we go. <laughs> um, let's see here. Are you guys seeing anything yet? No? No. Okay. There we Are you go. Seeing that? Yes. Okay. So. That was what we just had. Okay, so here are her 10 benefits of being an in-home childcare provider. No commute, you get to choose your clients, you get to be present for your own family, you get to work with children and their families. And she said, you know, of course, if you're somebody who's interested in this line of work, in working with children is a positive. Um, and that tied in with becoming part of your clients family, that if you, you really love the job, it's really nice to see the, the kids, but then also get to kind of talk to the parents about what's going on with the kids' development and things like that. Get to kind of be your own boss and set your own days off and make the rules, um, make memories with the kids you care for that goes with becoming part of the client's families and working with children. You get to go outdoors where with a nine to five sort of job or even a, a um, restaurant job or hospitality, you might be inside a lot. And then the final thing that she said was you get to be home and attend to some things around your house, which um, a lot of us at times when we're stressed out because of our work, we think, wow, um, if I could just be home for part of the day or half the day or a day to take care of some things around the house, that would be really helpful. So um, I can send the link later for this, but this video, like I said, I think these 10 things are pretty straightforward and this video is about six minutes. 
The other videos are longer and I think they're more thought provoking. So I wanted to um, get to those. So I don't know how to go to YouTube. Um, so what I'm gonna do, this next video is um, the drawbacks, the 11 drawbacks. And I tested this video and my audio the other day. And I think I've got it set so that it works better than the last time we tried YouTube videos. But in case it doesn't and people want to do their own thing, I put in the chat box the link. And if you decide to watch this video that way, I just ask that you mute your Zoom button so that we don't hear your computer in the background. But otherwise, I'm going to play it through this and it, I know it can get kind of glitchy. The audio can be bad and also just the transmission speed not can be sort of clunky. So if anyone decides to do this on their own, I completely understand. Just come back to the Zoom call when you're finished. But otherwise, I'm gonna call up this video. Oh, crud. Oh, what do I need to do? Okay. So I need to go to... There we go. Are you guys still seeing this? Hey guys, we are here from Work Life School where we talk about balancing all the things in between work and life, everything in between. And today I'm going to be talking about the 10 drawbacks of being a childcare provider with one bonus um, because I thought of 11. Um, and this video is for anyone who is a childcare provider, so maybe you don't feel so Sorry. alone because this can be a very isolating profession and sometimes people only talk about the good things and it's also good for those of you who are maybe on the fence or are in the process of becoming a child provider so I can share with you some of the downfalls to maybe avoid or to prepare for in case they happen to you and also this could be beneficial just for parents in general um, to kind of know what some things are that affect a child care provider just so maybe you could be a good teammate with your provider so that they can provide the best care for your child so let's jump right in and just to preface i just want to say that this is kind of a hard video to talk about because you know normally you want to talk about all the good things of your job but i do want to be really transparent about the hard parts i do love my job um, I love almost everything about it, but there are some things that are hard, some of which I've gone through, some of which I haven't, but I know people who've gone through them, so I just thought this would be a helpful video for you guys. One of the drawbacks of being a child provider is that your home gets messy and it gets worn out a lot faster. Now that's to be expected, but it is kind of hard working from home. Now it is nice to be in your home, of course, but it is hard if you have a lot of kids maybe breaking things. I've had a chair get broken. I've had various little things get broken, toys, um, you know, paint get scratched on things, get color on things. And obviously that's part of the job, but it is kind of a drawback because you do have to replace things more often, clean a lot more often, do a lot more dishes and things like that. Um, and I would say that is overall a negative thing, but it's also to be expected. So in my benefits video, I talked about how there is no commute and how great that can be. But the second drawback that I find with childcare is that you can go a little stir crazy because you don't leave the house. I personally live in Minnesota. And so five to six months a year, we have really cold, snowy winters. And sometimes it's just like you really can't leave the house. There's blizzards. Parents might still bring the kids to you, but you can't really leave. It's not like you can walk to the park. It can be very isolating and hard to never leave your home and never be, you know, switching from place to place. I am an introvert, but that doesn't mean I don't like to like get out of my house, but it can be kind of hard. So it's important to plan times to get out of your house at night and to really make use of the nice weather to get out over walks, be outside and things like that, because it can make you a little crazy. The third drawback of being a child provider is that there's very limited adult interaction. Um, at Pickup Tech, you can often find me like really trying to chat with the parents just because it is hard to not have that interaction throughout the day. I don't go somewhere and have adults around me. 
granted that can be kind of nice especially if you don't like small talk and stuff like that but it, it can be kind of hard to just talk to little people all day and you're whining and you know talk to two-year-olds who don't have a very vast vocabulary and things like that it's often a joy to talk to them but it is hard when you don't have a lot of adult interaction so it's important to plan ways to get that into your life maybe call a friend at the end of the day go see a friend um and stuff like that really make you of your spouse if you're married and just make sure you're getting some adult interaction because you can get a little nuts just talking to kids all day a lot of the drawbacks also fit with the benefits they're kind of like a double-edged sword i guess you could say they are a pro but they also are a con um, and one of those is my fourth drawback is that because you are setting your own rules and you are your own boss you have to set your rules and you have to be your own boss and that can be kind of hard um, especially as somebody who really loves to care for people and doesn't like to disappoint people it can be very hard at times to enforce your policies if somebody's going against them and it's sometimes hard to tell people that this is a decision i had to make that was best for my group and for my business and it may not be the best decision for that family. And that could be really, really difficult. But I've dealt with that in lots of different ways, from small ways to big ways. Um, and it's important to be a professional and part of being professional is sticking with what you say you're going to do. And so if you have something in your policy you're not going to enforce, don't put it in there. Um, and just make sure you put policies into place that really do matter to you, even if you are afraid of maybe- Jimmy, we're gonna make some Nice. James is, you know, doing something the parents aren't in love with. Like, for example, for a very small example, maybe parents all want to send their kids in flip flops, but it's driving you crazy. They're breaking, the kids are getting hurt, they're tripping. And so you need to put into place a policy of having only tennis shoes, even in the summer. That can be kind of hard because parents might need to go out buying shoes or something like that. But it's just important that you do what you need to do. For the safety of your children that's best for your business and that you know sometimes makes your job a little bit easier so you can be the best provider there is now that doesn't mean go make every rule and it's you up to be reasonable obviously but that is one drawback is having policies and enforcing them and making sure you're staying on top of everything as your own boss the fifth drawback is that almost every child provider works some kind of long hours. Rarely do you see a child provider in their home who is only working 40 hours. And that's because most of the parents are working at least 40 hours. So they need time to drop their child off, commute for their lunch break and stuff like that. So I personally am open 10 hours a day and even that is kind of short. A lot of people are open longer. I just know for me, I would burn out quickly if I was open any longer than that. Um, and it can be really hard to plan appointments, run to the bank, things like that, because you're open longer than most businesses. So that can be a drawback as well. And just trying to balance having days off and time off, but not always working and not trying to do all of the business related things that you couldn't get to during business hours on your days off, because you sometimes need those to rejuvenate as well. So it's a fine balance because you do work such long hours. The sixth drawback is that often, Child care providers are not viewed as professionals. They're often called babysitters. Um, people don't always take them seriously. And especially with stuff in the news, um, it can't, it's not always viewed in a positive light. And that can be kind of hard. I mean, I went to school for five years. I'm one class away from my master's. I was a teacher. Um, so I really tried to upsell that um, in my interviews and really come off as a professional from the beginning and say this is my business i am not a babysitter i am a child professional um, and i have to run my business in that way but it can be hard for people to stand their ground when they are often viewed in a way that's not always so positive so that is hard especially when parents want you know certain things but then they don't view as a professional so it's hard balance to make sure they're getting what they want, but making sure that you're getting what you want as a professional and having that um, label because labels are important and it's important to carry yourself and be respected in the community. The seventh drawback to being a child care provider in your home is that you have no regular break during the day. Now, granted, I do have nap time during the day, but I'm still 100% responsible for my children during that time. I can't like just leave. I can't even go outside. 
Um, and I have to be checking on them regularly. And if any of them wake up or do anything, like that's on me to take care of them. So while I do get a, a pseudo break, um, you don't have any time to like run to the bank or eat lunch like at a restaurant or meet a friend. Um, sometimes it's hard to make phone calls. You're trying to be really quiet during nap time. So that can be hard as well to not have like an official break like a lot of people have in their jobs, but you're still in your home um, and confined to the limitations of nap time and licensing and things like that. The eighth drawback that has been very stressful for me is that your house always has to be ready. No matter what, come Monday, if you're open, at 7 a.m. or whenever you open, your house has to be daycare ready. The licensing here in Minnesota is very strict. Um, people have gotten in trouble for having a bobby pin in the bathroom. Um, you know, you can't have scissors and knives and stuff out. And, you know, when you live in a house with a family, that can be sometimes kind of hard. If you were painting or doing some kind of project like that over the weekend, you're, it all has to be put away out of reach. Um, and of course that makes sense, but it can also be hard because your house has to be clean and ready from Monday. You can't just like have a party and say, oh, I'll get to it cleaning up on Wednesday. Nope, it has to all be ready. Your house has to be picked up, clean, um, look presentable and everything when you are open. And that can be pretty difficult, especially like we've been working on our daughter's room and getting new furniture and trying to put that together. And I can't open the boxes or do anything until I know I for sure have time to set it up before the time of open again, because we can't have stuff just like floating around that can be dangerous. So that is one drawback. Um, you do work around it, but it can be kind of annoying at times. The ninth drawback, um, that may not be a drawback for everyone, but I have seen how it has affected my family is that not everyone in your family will always love what you do, um, especially in children. If you have young children or any children in your home, even teenagers, they may, sometimes like your job, sometimes hate it. And that could be hard, especially if that was one of the main reasons why you got into this business is to support your family and to be there for them while also bringing you an income. Um, I know for my daughter, who's currently two and I have one on the way as well at the filming of this video, um, she doesn't really know any different, but I can see a, a big difference in her between daycare hours and non-daycare hours. She definitely acts up a lot more during daycare hours. Um, and I think she finds it a lot more peaceful when the kids are gone. Um, and I know as she gets older and we bring a new baby in, that may even be more effective. Maybe she'll love it more, but maybe she may have parts she doesn't like because there'll be a child she doesn't like. Maybe she's just sick of people being in the house. Um, and you know, when you have school-age kids, it may be hard to have all these little kids running around in their home. And even your spouse, it may be hard. I know for my husband, Sam, he's super supportive, but I know it probably can get annoying when I get annoyed with him for like leaving a knife out or not putting stuff away, stuff like that, um, or just being in my way during the day, which, you know, it's his house. So it, it can be kind of hard when your house is your business and your family is still here. Um, but it also is a huge benefit. So I make sure, you know, as my daughter gets older, I will talk to her about why. I am doing this and it's for her and for her our family, you know, financially and just so that mommy can be doing something she really loves and be here for you and stuff like that. But it can be hard to continue doing this if your family is not on board. And kind of piggybacking off of that, the 10th drawback is that it's very hard to have a work-life balance. It's kind of funny because that's what our channel is a lot about. Uh, but it can be really hard to have a work-life balance when you work from your home. And that goes for all work-from-home jobs. When you don't have a separation, it's really easy to have no boundaries and to be working all the time. Or on the flip side, I'm sure for a job provider, it could be really easy to feel like you should be doing all these homey things, but you have to cater to the kids. So it's this hard thing of finding the right balance between your work life and your home life even when they kind of intercept. So I have worked really hard to have boundaries and to, you know, save all my work for during the work day, utilize nap time to get some stuff done for daycare. Um, and when the kids are playing, getting ready for the next day, like curriculum wise and stuff. But as a new provider, that was really hard for me. Um, and I was doing a lot of stuff at night and early morning and just feeling like I was never shutting off. And that it's really important to be a good provider to have times when you're not a provider when you're just a mom or just a human being uh, because it's 
it's not healthy to be working all the time. And the little bonus drawback that I thought of is that little people are a lot of work and so are their parents. Um, I would be lying if I said every moment of every day is amazing and there's never any issues. Any parent or anyone who's been around small children knows that they can be difficult. Um, there's tantrums, there's throwing food, there's breaking things, there's, you know, lying, whining, all those things. I mean, they're not constant all day, uh, but those are little things like every day where it can get a little annoying um, or hard to deal with and a provider has to make that decision if it too much to deal with or is it manageable and make a decision based off of that but on top of that a lot of what I've read and what I've learned and seen um, is that sometimes it's not just the kids that's hard to deal with it's the parents and that's to be expected because you're caring for their precious little miracles who they created who they love um, and they're paying you to care for them so they feel like they have a say which they do to some extent um, but that can be hard sometimes, it can be conflict, it can be emotional at times, especially if you hate dealing with conflict, um, and just making sure you're enforcing your policies, but also, you know, looking at what's best for the children and trying to make your families happy. It's, it's a hard balance sometimes, um, there's not always a win-win situation. That can be very difficult um, for a people pleaser and somebody who doesn't always think of that kind of part of it when you go into the business and that was definitely something I knew about um, but not something I was really prepared for totally because you never really know what's going to happen what issues might crop up you may be happy but a parent may be unhappy with something um, and it could be something simple like you're not going to the park enough or um, your food's not the right amount of vegan or you know whatever it could be everybody has an opinion and it's impossible to make every single family happy 100 percent of the time because they all have different kids different wants different schedules um so it's just learning to be okay with that and do the best you can and you know resolve conflicts when needed and then if if it's too much then determining care if that's something you have to do which i guess is another difficult thing with this job is that you sometimes have to you know, make the hard decision to terminate care. It's not always easy. Um, it's probably never easy, but um, sometimes it's what's best for everyone. Uh, but you usually have to initial, initiate that. So those are my top 10 drawbacks. So I think some people are still watching the video, so I'm going to let them do that. I apologize. I screwed up my share screen. Good job, Christina. We could still hear her just fine. It worked. It was all compelling without it. Okay. I, I was like trying to get it full screen and somehow I stopped my share screen when I went to full screen YouTube mode. I shouldn't operate Zoom. You know what, it, it, it didn't really matter because we could hear her and we okay. know, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think it would have been any different seeing her. Okay. So no worries. Um, so what are people's thoughts and reactions to those drawbacks that um, were presented? Yeah, well, I have to say, I wasn't surprised by any of them. I mean, it's all she made a list of reasons why I would never do it I mean, <laughs> in a million years. You know, I mean, I, I can't think that that list is like, there's not one thing that I thought, oh, I hadn't thought of that. And I was kind of like, yeah, all of them, you know, there wasn't anything. And, you know, when then she talked about how she works 10 hours a day, which I totally get. I mean, it just, it should, if I were thinking about having a, there's a little guy there. <laughs> if I were thinking about having a, yeah, if I were thinking about having a, a home 
daycare like that, I would absolutely not do it after I listened to that. I mean, because I would know all those things, but just to hear her, you know, verbalize it would just totally convince me that it would just be a crazy way to live my life. Jane, what about you? Were you ready to say something? Well, I think um, I, I was curious about how many children she, on average, she was taking care of, because I think that makes... That. From the other videos, she had like six other kids and then she, so she had her one daughter and she was expecting, so then for a while she had her two kids plus six other kids in the house. See, I, that, that's a lot. That's a yes. lot. I mean, that's Too why, many. that's why there, that she has opinions about some of these things. Um, and the other thing I would be, that I, that I always think about now that we've had these town hall meetings is, if she had some sort of support network with other home-based mm -hmm. child care providers, she wouldn't feel so isolated and not viewed as a professional, perhaps. And, you know, not talking, I mean, you can't do it during the day, obviously, when you're taking care of the children. But right. I think some sort of support system would, would help in this case. Um, and I wondered... Although I don't think a lot of these things would go away if she weren't licensed, but I wondered how much of the licensing uh, rules and policies affected some of these these issues that she was talking about <clears throat> in terms of you know their house always ready. She talked about you can they can drop in any time and. and a person found a, I forget what they found in the bathroom, a bobby pin or something. Um, you know, wh whether that has any impact on some of this home-based care, some of these home-based care issues. Mm. Well, that was know. one of the things that struck me because I think in previous town hall meetings and other meetings that we've had regarding child care, um, and I know what the Department of Health and Human Services, part of what they've tried to do is reach out to home-based providers to get certified or licensed because we've talked about it with this general um, idea that that's a good thing and I do think that's a good thing right but then when you understand I, I, I think that was compelling how hearing her talk about the stress that's involved with those things and then you're taking on certification or licensure and then like you said you don't have that larger group center support system so you're doing right. cleaning you're doing the food you're doing the child care just the the amount of stuff that she's doing by herself was like yeah. wow yeah yeah you know at the children's center here in sister bay up up in sister bay um that's why they they work each person they work 10 hours a day but four days a week and you do mm -hmm. have to work 10 hours a day because you need the right. drop-off period and the and the pickup right. period that makes sense parents are working and they have they have the um scanned is providing the lunches so they're not having to prepare the food there they prepare snacks you know morning and afternoon snacks but they're not preparing the food and, and they have volunteers that come in and help. So uh, it's it's very different, mm -hmm. very different. And you have uh, other adults at the center that you in, that you interact with and get right. support from. Right, right. It just sounds like a stay-at-home mom with six little kids. I was a stay-at-home mom and I had two, you know? <laughs> two boys, it was enough, <laughs> you know? And as the oldest of seven, I can picture the scene, but my, but it's different when it's your house and it's your kids too. It's easier. Mm -hmm. I mean, this just sounds to me so hard and it doesn't even sound safe. Uh, hi, I'm my, and my name's Monica. I'm joining, I joined in the, on the meeting today because mm -hmm. I'm in school for early childhood. Uh -huh. Monica. And um, part of, part of the, with home doing daycare in the home is you're the only one like she was saying she's the mm -hmm. only one so you don't get that break like if you mm -hmm. want to go on vacation you get people that get really mad at you because they have to find daycare for that week that you want to have a vacation so when you're right. 
you're the only provider. It would be really nice if the if somehow home care could get together and be backups or that's what I kind of, my, my daughter's working at a daycare. I'm a massage therapist, but I'm doing this as a backup for my hands ever give out. And, mm -hmm. and as a backup for some of these people that are doing this home daycare to be able to say, Hey, I can take on for a week, for a couple of days while you take vacation or, or come in and give you an hour break or just, you know, that's the kind of thing I want to be able to be a, a break person. <laughs> right. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that's so important. I again I'm I'm gonna use the center as an example, but yeah. you know, they have they have children there from six weeks old to six years old, five years old, five years old. Um and to me, working and I've worked in most all those rooms. And when you're working in the six week to 10 month or 11 month, you do, I mean, even there, you do not get a break because those yep. babies are all on different schedules and they eat it different and sleep it For different. Sure. And you play. And so to be a home care provider, um, you know, yeah. I don't know if home care providers limit themselves to a certain age group or, you know, how they, a certain number of children. Well, and so they do that, that number. Go, go back to that. I'm sorry, go, go, go back to that chart that we talked about earlier, right? When we had 8% licensed home care provide, uh -huh. home providers, 7.6 unlicensed home-based provider, and then we had all these family members and neighbors, yeah, we had right. about 35%. So then the, the, right. the thing that strikes me is if we want to provide support and resources to those people, like we just heard, this this woman is a conscientious licensed home right. provider. And even if you take that part out, all the other stuff that she's talking about, the isolation, the no break, the long days, you have to keep your house reasonably clean, feeding them, dealing with parents. All of that stuff is just a tremendous amount, even if you had three kids <laughs> and six kids, right, Rosemary? How so do you go to the bathroom? <laughs> Where does she go to the bathroom? With all the children. <laughs> does she bring them all in like we used to do with the kids? All right, come on, Toby, Teddy, mommy's going to the bathroom. I'm in the bathroom that's with how, you. That's how we went to the bathroom when my That's how we did it. I know, Brian, too. I didn't bring six in. <laughs> Who's got a bathroom that big? <laughs> <laughs> liability how about that they learn a lot about the sexual organs when they're little kids because you yeah little. they'll forget <laughs> <laughs> they'll forget when you need them to know so i think that this helps us you know it's like it brings all of those things like you said none of it's surprising when you hear it but when it all gets presented in a 15 minute clip and you it's think wow how do people do this and but it's a, it's a critical part of our child care system for the community how can we help support them how can we do what's best for the the kids do people have thoughts on that or margie and missy uh, and Ryan, anything else um, yeah it's giving me a bunch of flashbacks and um many families want that kind of setting um, even if there are openings in other larger places, um, there are many families who feel, I want my child to be in a small setting that feels like home. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's, so if there are families who want that, and there are people like this woman who choose that for her work, um, I like to think even when my kids are in my own house that I'm keeping it safe, I'm keeping it clean. And when I'm paying someone, I have way higher expectations than I do Absolutely. When, when it's a Monday morning at my house with my four kids. Right. So it's, um, it's, it will always need to be an option because pe many people want that as an option. So how do you keep people bucked up, you know, to try to be that kind of provider? Um, 
when it's hard, it's hard all the way around to do that. You know, Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I wish there was a way to have something, um, I don't want to say a little below, but something a little less than licensing where you're still able to say, you know, I belong to this local organization that is a network of home care providers where we um, get together and we have seminars and sessions and we learn X, Y, and Z and we're applying and that and that, and that organization becomes known to the community. So the people in the community say, oh yes, I've heard of that. And I know that their home is a good place to take my children, even though they're not licensed. If for, if for some reason this licensing bill issue is stopping people from either providing childcare or um, even being interested in, in trying it, but yet there's a, a support group. I, I still think the support group is, can be, can be yeah, really helpful. Without the support group aspect, um, Alexis dropped off. I'm not surprised given my snafu with Zoom and sharing the screen and she was trying to provide dinner for her family. But if Ryan is plugged in, I'm gonna ask him to chime in if, if he knows, because I don't think Missy, Monica, you might know too, but none of us have young children. And I know that there's the fa the local Facebook and like the rummage sale or whatever Facebook page where a lot of communication about this stuff goes on. Do we kind of have a social media network of finding out the good home-based providers, Ryan? Do you know, like reputations? Um, I'd say not really. I mean, there, there are groups of people that, you know, um, I can't remember what it was called, but there's a, you know, parents group here in, in Door County, and there's probably a couple hundred people in it, but I don't think it, it's not very active as far as, mm -hmm. hey, you know, I'm available this day, I can take care of kids, or, or you know, who's available, it's, um, unless they're doing it behind the scenes, you know, as far as private messaging and stuff like that, but the, the group itself. And no, I don't think there's, there's not very much. I mean, what, who we rely on is our friends. So mm -hmm. um, if uh, we're, we're lucky because all our friends have different schedules. So some are available some days if we need them and, and other days um, we can rely on other people. So in that sense, yeah, we have a, a group that we can, we can go to and rely on, but it's not, um, it's not like a big network or anything like that. Yeah, and locally, Jane, there is um, a network called the, I have mentioned it before in other meetings, so it might sound familiar. The Wisconsin Early Education Shared Services Network, WESEN, mm -hmm. which is part of the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association, WECA, right? And WECA has a very good um, reputation. Ruth Schmidt has been in the business for like, over 30 years, she's incredibly knowledgeable. Um, and then now they've started this WESEN, the Shared Services Network. We've spoken to them about this. The childcare, the home-based providers need to reach out and say, I want to be part of this network. Mm -hmm. Door County doesn't have anybody who has said, I want to be part of this network. So we are this little enigma where they've got regions around the state because the state is so big. They, they, uh, Wieson has regions and they provide um, back office support for accounting. They supply, they provide this social support. They help link people up with trainings and all of these different things. But Door County, I, from everything I have heard, um, it's like home-based care, in-home care is like hide the ball. People are so protective of that information of who the in-home providers are. Oh. You just can't break the code until oh. you're looking for it. Is that, do you think that's an unfair description, Ryan? No, I think, I think it's fair. And I think part of that mm -hmm. um, comes from, I think, you know, there's a handful that aren't licensed or probably, you know, a majority that aren't licensed and 
and they don't want uh, that getting out or anything like that. So I'm sure that comes into that too, why they're so tight lipped about it. Mm. Well, I will say that um, the woman who was the example, there are, um, whether they're licensed or not, um, when I um, lived in another state, some income um, care providers, they hired some help from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So as the kids trickle in and as they start to trickle out, depending upon um, what the work hours are of the parents, you know, when it's heavy lifting time, Mm -hmm. um, or it may be until nap time. I have someone who helps me from nine until one. If you were mm -hmm. looking right. at nap time at one, you know, by the time. <coughs> um, so that because in the middle of all this as well, what what isn't called out is it may be six and maybe three of them are learning to be toilet trained. Yeah. So have that in the mix of it as well. So, yeah, I know. <laughs> like that. I mean, so I just remember what it was like when I had a, an early childhood program that was either half day or full day, and you just had to keep track who's toilet training and, you know, who's on Jason today and who's just going to be watching for when you start to see Jason do the dance that means get him to the bathroom, you know, so there's a lot of factors at play. I, I, that woman managing six, six a range of ages mm. um, seems unsustainable. Right. Yes. So Ryan I, or anybody, Maggie maybe more. Monica. It's not illegal to have a home-based care when you're not licensed, is it? I, That's not I considered illegal, I mean, is I, it? I've looked at it before. I think I, I think I want to say you're allowed to have like three kids if you're unlicensed. Okay. I don't I don't okay. quote me, but yeah, uh -huh. Any, anything more than that. And I think you're supposed to be licensed. Technically. I, see. I think it's like three or four and there's only a certain number that can be your own, right? right? Yeah. A certain number that can't be your own. And okay. then even if you're licensed in your home base, I believe the limit in Wisconsin is like around six or eight or something like okay. that. Yeah, I think it's eight. Well, it all depends on the ages. If you have yeah, under yeah. the age of two, you can only have six total children. That's including your own. Yeah, yeah. And that—that's that's another that's thing that, that I was going to mention too. Is, <laughs> yeah. is the drawbacks of it is you could per licensing you can only have so many children. So you either need to it needs to be like a a job that you have, and then your spouse has another job if you want to be able to sustain it and you know uh, make enough income. But it's not really something being a home care child provider. Um, unless you're really frugal and able to do it, even with the maximum amount of kids that you can have in there, it's still not a whole lot of right. money annually. Right. And then if you want to, like you said, Margie, if you want to bring help in at different parts of the day, hopefully they're volunteer because you might, you probably won't have, <laughs> you know, a lot of money left over to pay them. Right. Yep. King. So I, this was today and, or, I think it was today. I was look. I told Christina I was looking around at things today, uh, anticipating the the meeting tonight. I I thought I saw a headline read that there has been a lot of money that's now been allocated by the federal government for grants to try and do something about childcare in our country. Um, I don't know if anybody else has read about this or whether it's something, some grant money that we can get a hold of to try and I get, I know you have to have a proposal obviously to, to get grant money, but to, to try and um, get some sort of, I don't know if it would be further study of home-based care or to try and get some something set up so that we can encourage and support more home-based care here in Door County. Since we aren't gonna have very quickly another center-based care situation coming up. Yeah, I think um, like Margie was saying, so there are certain families that we need to have a variety of options available in the right. 
to best serve the families because um, even if people could afford a center, that's not the, um, the setting that some families want to have their kids in. Um, right. And also geographically, even if you located another center in Door County, it's still a lot of um, transportation and logistics exactly. for people. So th this home-based network is even more important for, for Door County. And I think where people have a difficult time when you say, can you get grant money to support home-based care? Given what the discussion we've had and hearing this woman talk, my next question is, do you mean licensed or certified home-based care? Or do you mean whatever sort of home-based care? And if you were saying whatever sort of home-based care, do you think the federal government will give we'll support money that. for something that's not certified or licensed? I think, I don't know the answer yeah. to that, but I yeah. think we'd be hesitant. Good point. I would think so. I would think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, Christina, I told you I was... Um, list, I went. I was in a s seminar on Zoom with. It was actually given by Griffin House Publishing, but included in that seminar was the CEO of NA, NAEYC, the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Um, but there are other these other people, and one of them was a Sarah Vanover, who's written a book coming out in May, May first, called America's Child Care Crisis. And a couple of quotes that I liked that she said is, child care is an industry that supports all other industries, which I thought was yeah. relevant. Yeah. very relevant. But she also emphasized, we have to have family care child homes. Huh. We're not going we're not going to cover it all with, you know, kinder care. Huh. huh. Yeah. So when that book comes out, I'd like to read it. Maybe we Yeah, so I, I think I agree um, that the, the home-based care um, across the, the county um, is not going away, should not go away. Right. We would right. just like to be able to have a better sense of what's going on and mm -hmm. offer, so like, people have said to connect families, to help people know a sense of, of what's out there rather than navigating it completely on their own. That's just a bunch of stress for families that if we if there could be somebody to help alleviate or help them along, also support the childcare providers, that that would be a real service. But that is a huge undertaking. In my mind now after studying and researching and learning about all sorts of child care for a year now. Um, my opinion is that is a full-time job for an organization um, to create that system and sustain it and keep track of people coming in and out because part of the home-based child care compared to the group centers as I believe it's more fluid. People are in for a little bit of time and then they're out. Um, but that's exactly also why it's a valuable service for right. people to right. be keeping track of. Right. Um, and just if really there, but it's all got to be local also, I, I think just at this point, maybe at some point some state and federal funding would come behind it. But I think that's a really high bar right now. So to create your local network, which isn't doing accounting and stuff like that, it's just a one-stop shop for information about the local network of home-based childcare. Um, that, that would be a great service to the community. Um, it makes sense to, in my mind, to start with the home-based providers who are in existence. Um, but have, I have not been able to connect with them. And I don't know, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, if other people have other ideas, um, I'd like to hear them too. The woman who is on, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't recall your name, who's going to school right now? Are you still on? Yes, my name's Monica. I'm, I'm sorry? My name's Monica. Monica, 
This yeah. is Margie asking you a question. Where you said you're go, you're taking classes in early childhood, correct? Correct at NWTC. NWTC. Mm -hmm. Okay. What okay. if any mention do the instructors at NWTC make about the connection between uh, child care providers in Door County? They, they, the only thing they really say is that there really isn't a lot of child care in Door County because they, um, they like, because we, as, as a student, we have to do practicums. We have to work with daycare providers. It can either be a center or it can be with individuals. I, I do know um, Karen Zellhofer, who a lot of people are fighting to get into her daycare. She's a home care provider. Um, I've also went out to Brussels and did some stuff in the Brussels Care Center. My daughter works at the what used to be the YMCA one. Now it's just uh, Door County uh, Daycare or whatever. Now my daughter works there as a daycare provider hmm. and is also going to school. Um, hmm. So did you lose me? Because my internet's not all that great. Oh, no. You're good. Okay. Good. So, but they, so they do have a hard time finding places for people to go in Door County to do their practicums. Yeah. So, I mean, so the, the only, I only know of a couple home daycare certified. And I think they usually, they want people that are certified or have taken classes. But I know mm -hmm. some people, um, like even when I went to one of the centers and worked just to, to asking questions and stuff, they, their only certification was by reading a book. And like, now I'm going to classes and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, 500 some dollars a class to, to get certified for something that I'm just want to be a volunteer kind of thing to help out. Yeah. Because I know the, the lack of daycare. So um, hmm. I, I, I think some people, if you're certified, if you're going to do all the schooling, you're going to be upset if somebody's going to get paid the same thing as you are and you paid all this money out to get mm -hmm. educated to do the class. I mean... I don't know. They we had to watch this whole big thing on raising America. Have you seen that series of films? Yeah, I have. Um, but um, with the the film that we've been showing um, is no small matter, but it covers a lot of the same territory as raising America. Okay. Yeah. So I said that it's really has brought a lot of stuff to the forefront for me, thinking that something needs to be done. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to note that it's I know it's five after six after seven and I understand if people have to leave I'm perfectly um happy to stay on the line and continue the conversation but if anyone has to leave and wants to make a final comment before they leave I'm going to give up people a minute to do that so I just wanted to mention to Monica that at the Children's Center in Sister Bay um, there is some sort of, you know, they take some sort of classes uh, if you don't have a degree. And as you said, they are, they are taking, they're reading a book, but they take the tests online and it costs, I think, between three and four hundred dollars. So it's not like they're, um, you not uh, getting what would be a valid, I guess, background of knowledge for it. They, they're not in front of a, a person taking a class, but they are um, doing the homework and the questionnaires and doing a test online. So hopefully, hopefully it's, you know, giving them the same or, or close to the same sort of uh, knowledge base that you're getting in your class. Maybe for a little less money, though. A lot less money. <laughs> but, I mean, but you know, the nice thing about the in class or, I mean, because a lot of classes now are online because because of COVID, but there is that the, the learning practicums that you have to go and you have to, you know, you have to actually show that, you know, I don't know. I, I just, I think it's a very valuable thing to have people go through things because there's a lot of things that I went, I mean, as a parent, I went, oh my gosh. And I was like, Man, did I screw up my kids? We would all say that. Yeah, no worries. No worries. <laughs> we would all say that. Uh, but I mean, you, you look at it, you're going, wow, you know, I wish I would have known this. I wish I would have known some of these things because there's, 
there, there is a lot more to the brain development and all the things that, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's amazing. And I think there's a lot to be said about people that go through this and then, and do the job. I mean, I, I mean, wow, I don't think I could do this seven days or five days a week, 10 hours a day watching so. all right. these children, you know, without having some relief system. So these home right. daycare providers, I, I don't know how they do it. I, re I really don't because, mm -hmm. I mean, I, the one thing I found with my friend was that she was saying how mad people would get at her because she wanted to take a vacation, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> because not all the same families take vacations at the same time. So she has maybe four, fam four or five families. She's watching their children and one takes a vacation one time and another one takes another time. So she's she doesn't have a week off that she doesn't have children unless she takes a vacation. And then she gets some very mad parents because they got well, a crap mind. They shouldn't be mad. Right. 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 But they, right. Yeah. But if they can't find daycare, then they have to take off. You know what I mean? I mean, I understand. I can understand what they're saying what's happening you know as far as the parents too because they're like now what do I do I mean you can't you have to really plan ahead I guess you know as a home sure. daycare you got to say I'm going to take vacation in six months and this is the week I'm going to take and mm -hmm. you know so you really have to be organized in a planner to be able to do home daycare <laughs> I think I Ryan wanted to add or respond to something that you said Monica okay you no, know, I just I just wanted to say I got to get going. But one thing I wanted to uh, to ask or maybe mention before before I dropped off here, I don't know if it would be beneficial as far as getting that network of uh, in home care providers or getting them to come out and be listed if there was some sort of small financial gain. I don't you know like a excuse like a, like a reverse subscription, right? So they, they agree to be on this list. They agree to have their info listed and for each month they're on it or, or whatever, they get a small financial incentive. I don't know if that would draw people out and want to be more apt to being on this, this list here for Door County. That's a good idea. I think you're, you're right, Ryan. It, it, when I think about these networks or these um seminars or that they could take as a group, it would not be at any expense to them. That's why that's why I was wondering about these grants that are being going to be made available and how we could possibly use them because they can't, they can't afford to pay, you know, for yeah. this sort of support when they're already probably kind of scraping by as it is. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if, if in the beginning we necessarily need, you know, grants or big grants or anything i mean if we could fundraise it oh you're doing the bunny thing i was like what is that <laughs> so if, if we could if, if we could fundraise it you know locally or through through whatever you know i mean we're just talking about you know small incentives and then maybe yeah. um, i mean they, um, have, they, have what the comes to that is that you provide certain amounts of information to confirm yeah. what's going on that you get for that money, not just being on part of the listing. That and you keep it updated, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that I yeah. think that's the beginning of a, an interesting idea. So I'll we'll okay. talk about that more. Thank we you. Gotta okay. read. You Thanks, Ryan. Thank, bye. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> <laughs> so Monica, I just want to say I think I have sent you an email before um, right. when we first talked on the phone. Is that right? Correct. So I'm, tell me again what that is, because if it's not under your name and it's something unusual, it won't. Yeah, my email is dorconeyhealingtouch at gmail.com. Because um, just the, the stuff that you're going, the, the classes that you've taken and stuff like that, um, you were not on this town hall meeting a couple weeks, or I guess maybe it was just last week when we had Aaron O'Toole from Door County Economic Development come and speak about the youth apprenticeship program that where um, high school kids are doing work-based learning um, as to complete their, as part of completing their high school degree. And they're, they're working at places throughout the county. 
And I have invited her, I asked her to invite students to come in March 2nd and talk about their experiences. But I think having your voice as additional voice of that conversation to hear about what it's like to be going through classes about childcare and early childhood development and how it's eye-opening and you're like, oh my gosh, you're like, it'll be different for them because it's all they've ever known. But your perspective is also interesting when you've already had kids and you're like, wow, I never knew that. So I just want to mention to you now that um, March said, because next week we're ha or two weeks from now, we're having Cindy Trinkner Piat from Northern Door mm -hmm. Children's Center talk about something else, but we have queued up for March 2nd, the, some youth apprenticeship students to talk. And um, if you were able to make it that evening to share your story too, that'd be great. Yeah, I sure can. Awesome. So I'm sorry I took a little side note. And it's quarter after, I'm, I'm still happy to talk, but if people have other things. Rosemary, yeah. did you want to do a home-based child business? Child no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm exhausted just from listening to this. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna leave now and go take a hot bath. Awesome. Seriously, this is too hard. <laughs> oh gosh. It is, but I, I what do you what was your reaction to Ryan's idea? Is that I've never thought about something like that, about some way to start a sort of home-based registry. Because that's the whole thing we want, we need. The beginning of something. I, I don't think we can be doing licensure. It's just too big of a gap, but we've got an existing network. And the, my goal is just, can we right. bring to light that existing right. network with, you know, no fear of judgment. And I think it, to have no fear of judgment or reporting right. means like we can't be going for state funding. We can't be going for federal funding. We just have to say, we know what's needed in our community. Right. I think that if, if if they could be if it could be shown how beneficial this would be to you to have to the to the providers to have this registry so that, you know, if they had an emergency or or anything like that, you know, it isn't just a vacation. We've right. all had elderly parents who suddenly need you. You know, I mean, when I think of the nights when my parents were alive where I would spend all night in the emergency room with them and then go to school the next day to teach or not go. I had the option of saying, I'm still in the emergency room with my parents or whatever. But if you have six kids coming over for daycare, do you know what? I mean, there's just too many reasons why you need to have backup. You need to have support. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, you know, good point. That's my thought. Mm -hmm. So, that registry serves as a resource for families with children who need childcare, but also serves as a resource for other home based providers who need mm -hmm. backup. Right. Or right. That's what I, yeah. The other nice thing is maybe some kind of resource like that would, if you had. Had, like I went, I my kids were part of the Head Start program to um, when they first started mm -hmm. school, and it was it was really nice. I was one of the um, parent. I don't know. I went to meetings all the time, but it would they, they had some um, educational things where the parents could attend these right. educational. Right. It'd be kind of a network that maybe if you let's say you wanted someone to come talk, that all these home providers could could either web it or or it would be where they could actually attend some classes and maybe get some credits towards towards uh -huh. getting licensed or whatever but if they were on a list they could be invited to these kind of things and yep. without being on a list you know you don't know who to invite and maybe right. that's part of what you agree to for part of the financial incentive is that you agree to receive certain communications or you know I don't want to make pet people come to something but maybe for one meeting a year or something like that that would be you know that would be easy to do for people I'm sure like mm -hmm. one meeting or you know mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and they might so. find that they want to do more because sure. right 
the support being there. You know, what's, what's being discussed is no different than what happens in a lot of public school systems. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that I, I mean, we may be using the word incentive, but it may be um, insulting to them to mm. hear the word incentive, but what may be appreciated is there are stipends for different levels of participation. So if I'm a fourth grade teacher, I earn a $700 stipend this semester when I'm the, the faculty member who hosts the chess club to two afternoons after school. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm acknowledging your effort. I'm acknowledging your importance. And in exchange for that, and your time. Um, we believe there, there's, there's, Good work is acknowledged by compensation. So right. receiving a stipend mm -hmm. for um, something that is a benefit to the people you serve as well as to you um, mm -hmm. would be a, a good thing for a community to do. Yeah. I like yeah. that. I like, I like that, that idea. I like that, that too. language. And I like the language, Margie. <laughs> yeah. 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 I like um, that too. Margie, the head up this ago. <laughs> Um, that's how a lot of stuff happens in the, the clubs, the after school mm -hmm. clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers do a lot of uncompensated work. I mean, mm -hmm. signing up for that when you sign up, you know it comes with the job. Um, but there, there's a limit at which you should be asked to keep um, digging in without something in return. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that you know you have to be thoughtful about that sort of registry and think through the issues but it's the idea it's the beginning of an idea of something that seems to have legs that we haven't come up with before mm -hmm. so that's why it's exciting to me because it just feels like we've been talking and talking and got crickets mm -hmm. so maybe you know and it's like what can we do what can we do so um this is something interesting and I, I think we'll we'll talk more um, about it but um so for the next time in two weeks like I said we have Cindy Trickner Piat and um Karen Corkin De La Mar is that how you say her name? De La Mar, mm -hmm. De La Mar. Uh, from Northern Door Children's Center who are going to come and talk about the the trilemma, which if you've been attending these meetings from the beginning, or maybe if you're, they talk about it in childcare education classes, but it's, um, so three things that push upon one another, particularly when you're running a group center, a licensed group center, and that is providing um, high quality care but keeping things affordable for the families while at the same time providing a living wage or a competitive wage, wage for mm -hmm. your providers. Right. Um, and so that is a real challenge. Um, <laughs> and especially without funding, Jane, like you said, um, with the new administration, maybe there's going to be some more money pumped in. Right. But right now with the current existence and um, introduction of 4K, which took out a big part of the, the ability to make money right. with um, group center business model, mm -hmm. that trilemma became even more difficult. Lemma. <laughs> more lemma. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's what we'll be doing um, two weeks from now. So um, thank you all once again a, a great discussion and we only went through a portion of the videos but yeah. as always we oh, had that's right yeah. yeah um so it's all good and um <laughs> so sh so she's quitting her business this same woman she quit her business and it was interesting the part of the third video what she talks about is the impact of covid and i thought that was interesting oh. to think about for the, we don't even know what the current pre-COVID situation for was our local home-based providers. So we also, we also don't know what the impact of COVID has been on so, people provided to stop providing care. And just so are you sending a link for both videos then, yes, Christine? I, I can do that, yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. So hearing her talk about that and Ryan was saying that, um, you know, she, she wouldn't make a lot of money, but I think for a home-based provider, when you take out the overhead of a group center, um, where you've got multiple people and you've got liability and, and she was paying liability insurance as a licensed provider. But I think with six kids, she was making a decent living. And that, and they did not spend a lot. So she talks about how when COVID hit, they took a look oh. at their finances and said, when we stop buying crayons and art supplies for things, when we stop paying for liability insurance, when we stop buying groceries for sick kids in daycare, the trade-offs are that we are going to be okay if we mm -hmm. decide to stop doing this. It was that, um, Financially, they were able to do it. And also the other thing about COVID that she talked about was um, the government response to child care providers and the lack of support that they got, that mm -hmm. they were seen as essential, but then in reality received very little support. Oh. And also the families were angry for saying things like, um, I can't believe you're not open. You know, which, which she talked about in the drawbacks, how dealing with children is in family. Right. And it, she just decided it's all just too much. She was mm -hmm. then pregnant with her third child and she said, this is oh. all just too yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. All righty. Monica, as we close up, thank you for speaking up. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for yeah. including me. Yeah, thanks for your input. Um, Absolutely. Thanks. All right. Good night, my friends. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, -bye. <laughs>